Good morning. We have been studying our way through the book of 1 Corinthians, and we are in the middle of our study of spiritual gifts in chapters 12, 13, and 14. Interesting, the love chapter is right in the middle, um, kind of giving us a hint that these spiritual gifts are to be uh, used uh, with love. And uh, if you look at chapter 13, you, you'll realize that uh, love is not rude. It doesn't boast. You know, it takes ego and arrogance out of the equation. So it's important that uh, we as believers today in the church at Corinth at that time realize that these spiritual gifts are from God and that we are to use them for edification of the saints and for the glorification of God in the kingdom. Uh, so last week we, we started off just talking about spiritual gifts in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, basically, I told you there are two extremes of groups. Uh, one is the uh, rigid um, cessationalists, those who believe that spiritual gifts have ceased. And then there are the uh, very liberal, um, what you would call uh, charismatics, that are sensationalists, that believe that uh, we have to have these manifestations of, of, of great spiritual power in the church and all kinds of hubbub and chaos and, and to, in order for the spirit to move, to work. And so just like many things in life, uh, in order to uh, walk a straight line and, and to not stumble around, we have to find a balance. And so I think it's important that that we balance out those two extremes and find ourselves somewhere in the middle. As I stated before, I, I used to be in the cessationalist camp. Um, I, I believe that those gifts had ceased, and, and I was uh, basing everything that we have today off of um, just pure talent and God-given ability. But it goes beyond that, and I think we know that, that uh, there are many things that we can't explain, uh, words that we say, thoughts that we have, insight, direction, um, the ability to speak about Scripture in a way that uh, isn't from ourselves. I think I experience that nearly every Sunday because it just seems like the Holy Spirit takes over in, in my words you know, I don't, I don't write them down anymore, uh, word for word, like I used to, and um, I just don't take a lot of notes. Maybe I should, uh, maybe I would uh, be a little more organized, but I feel like that allowing my study to, um, you know, permeate my brain and and then let God uh, hopefully use uh, the Holy Spirit to speak through my mouth and. I pray that's the case. I always pray that's the case, and um, I hope you do too. So let's let's just do a, a brief review of the first part of 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to go all the way through verse 8, and it's verse 8 that we're going to concentrate on this morning as we start getting into the discussion of the various gifts. And um, verse 8 contains two gifts, the gift of uh, the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom, but I, I'm not sure that we can get through both of them this morning. Um, again, we're we're taking this very slowly and um, going to try to try to really understand these gifts because, as Paul says right here in verse one, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Other versions say ignorant, but we need to know what this is about. It's very important to our function as an assembly, uh, not only to each other, but to the community and, and the kingdom of God. Then in verse 2, he says, You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray but to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So, Obviously, if, if we proclaim Jesus is Lord, um, we understand that uh, we are servants, slaves, and the Holy Spirit has empowered us with that knowledge and that, that feeling in our hearts. So Paul goes on to say there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. 
Um, there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is all the same God who empowers them all and everyone. So God the Holy Spirit gives a variety of gifts, all kinds of different gifts, and uh, we'll, we'll start going through those one by one. And there are varieties of service, the way those gifts are carried out and the, the way they're manifested. Um, but it's the same Lord Jesus Christ. And there are a variety of activities. And that would be the results of, of carrying out those gifts that have been given in whatever form or manner that they're demonstrated. But it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So we don't have, you know, Isis doing this and Jupiter doing this and Venus doing that. No, we have Yahweh distributing the gifts, um, giving us the power to carry them out, and then uh, demonstrating through uh, us uh, how those might work and what that looks like um, as they are distributed. To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And last week I talked about this being the very key verse, that everything that is done uh, in the Spirit's power, should be done for the common good. It's not to elevate, it's not to boost ego, it's to glorify God and to edify one another. So here's where he starts with the gifts in verse 8. For one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. So the same Spirit gives both of these different gifts a variety. Um, a word of knowledge or an utterance of knowledge or a utterance of wisdom or a word of wisdom. And there are some different thoughts about this, uh, but I want you to understand that, that these gifts are something that you would receive from God, uh, the Holy Spirit, allowing you to have insight of that you wouldn't otherwise know or wouldn't otherwise know how to carry out. Wisdom and knowledge are certainly different. Um, wisdom is, this is my definition, the divinely directed application of knowledge. So wisdom is saying just the right thing at the right time, and it's led by the Spirit. So you're going to get an insight and an understanding about um some certain type of information that comes your way, and you're going to know what to do with that information uh, led by the Spirit in a way that edifies others or gives glory to the God. To God, So you can see how um, the uh, gift of wisdom would be extremely handy. Um, I have some examples of the gifts of wisdom that I think clearly illustrate or demonstrate um, this application of knowledge being divinely given. Now, the first example is from Jesus, and, and we know that Jesus was full of grace and knowledge and wisdom. But in Matthew chapter 22, we have the tricky Pharisees trying to trap Jesus. Starting in verse 15 of Matthew 22, it says, Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. So we have the Pharisees and the camp of Herod, who supposedly hate each other. They're in league together against Jesus. Teacher, they said, We know that you are a man of integrity, and you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So Jesus is stuck with this question. Do you pay taxes to Caesar? You say, no, you don't pay taxes to Caesar. Either way, his answer is going to put certain people against him just by what he says. But Jesus... It says in verse 18, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And so they brought him a denarius. And he asked them, 
Whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar, and give to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. So certainly God in the flesh could give the exact answer for the exact uh, situation because he has all knowledge. But you understand the point. Sometimes uh, we're given insight into something that we don't know otherwise. And um, uh, it's not so much the application, but it's just the information we're able to relay um, that uh, doesn't puff us up, but builds others up or glorifies God. Our next example is going to be in Acts chapter 7. And uh, this is one of my favorite scriptures. Uh, I remember as a boy in VBS at the First Baptist Church in Unionville, actually, uh, we did a little play, I think it was in fifth grade, about the stoning of Stephen, and, and I got to play Stephen, and it was a, it was a big deal. I see that uh, I spelled Stephen wrong. It should be an E here. Um, we're going to start in verse 8 of chapter 6, and it's just going to describe Stephen and the wisdom that he had from God. It says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition, however, from the members of the synagogue and the freedom, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Sicily, or Sicilia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the Spirit, capital S, by which he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speaks words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So if you are empowered, uh, like Stephen, with uh, the wisdom of the Spirit, um, people are going to look upon you and see that you're different. Uh, you're going to be quite different from uh, these uh, Jews and and members of the synagogue that stirred up the people and the elders. They're, he's different from, from those who tell lies or get others to tell lies on their behalf. And, and they just make up stuff. Uh, and it's just interesting then that Stephen starts, starts this great speech to the Sanhedrin, and he, and he basically goes through the history of the Jews and finalizes with a statement that this Jesus of Nazareth, who you crucified, is the Messiah. And, and they go nuts and they stone him. But he had great wisdom, and uh, that's a great recording of Luke telling us about Stephen's great wisdom. Next, uh, in Acts chapter 15, this uh, is dealing with the first council of the church in Jerusalem, or the council at Jerusalem. And basically what had happened was Paul had went down uh, and preached among the Gentiles, and many were being saved. And the Judaizers had a problem with it. They, they said, hey, you've got to follow the laws of Moses, and you've got to be circumcised in order to be saved. It can't just be Jesus alone. So uh, Paul um, says, all right, let's go settle this thing. And so they go up, or they go down to Jerusalem, and they're going to meet with the council, of which... Um, James and Peter are both members. So let's pick up in verse 1 of chapter 15 of Acts. Uh, some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debated with them. 
So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some of the other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. The church sent them on their way as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria. They told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and require to obey the law of Moses. Well, the Pharisees are pretty pesky fellows. The apostles and the elders met considering this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. So, so here's this divine knowledge that, that Peter has. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, by faith, not because they followed the law of Moses, not because they were circumcised, but because they had faith in Jesus. And God made no distinction between them, uh, the Jews, the, the apostles, were, or the disciples were Jews, or the Gentiles who were being saved. The Holy Spirit was given to both groups. So then Peter says this, and I think this is divine knowledge. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our forefathers had been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of the Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Quite a statement. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders done through them. Um, God had done among the Gentiles through them. And when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon, Peter that is, has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. That'd be the church. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written from Amos 9, 11, 12. After this, I will return and rebuke David's fallen tent, that be Israel. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear by my name. So there you have Israel and the Gentiles. Says the Lord who does these things that hit, that have been known for ages. So the conditions that the Jews want to place upon the Gentiles for salvation are ridiculous. And James is clearly using scripture to uh, make his point. So here, here comes this divine knowledge because he's going to talk about just grace. It is my judgment, therefore that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. They're turning away from idols and toward God. And he doesn't want to make it hard or hassle the Gentiles because they're, 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 they're placing their faith in Jesus and disregarding the upbringing and the heritage that they've been raised with, and they're going on to something new, something holy, something set apart, and God, uh, I think, is speaking through James here. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food, polluted by idols, sexual immorality, the meat strangled from animals, and from drinking blood. Four things. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times, and is read in the synagogues on ab every Sabbath. And this is the, the fellowship that these um, new Christians will enjoy together. So those are two great examples, I think. And then the last example is, is <laughs> um, quite, yeah, it's entertaining. 
Um, uh, Paul's a smart guy. And this is Paul in Acts chapter 23. He's a smart guy. Um, he knows his parties, the Sadducees and the Pharisees very well. The Pharisees uh, believe in the resurrection of the dead, and the Sadducees don't. So Paul is brought before the Sanhedrin um, to be questioned. Uh, they've already beat him up. Um, so in chapter 23, yeah, 23, uh, we have this remarkable word of knowledge that the, that the Apostle Paul speaks. He says, Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Your stinky grave is what you are. You're like the walls outside of a rotting corpse. You sat there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. And those who were standing near Paul said, You dare to insult God's high priest? And Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the rulers of your people. Now, it's interesting how um, Ananias is the high priest, and Paul didn't realize he was. Um, Annas was the high priest, um, and we have some other high priests named, uh, but this is Ananias. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees, and others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. What a clever thing to say in his situation. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees according, uh, acknowledge them all. So what happens? There was a great uproar because of what Paul had instigated in this uh, division. And some of the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander, a Roman commander, was afraid Paul would be torn from pieces by them. He ordered the troops, the Roman troops, to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. So Paul is coming close to being beat up uh, and possibly killed by the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And instead, um, he utters this statement and and says, uh, I'm on trial because of the resurrection of the dead. And, and so because of that, they become uh, so angered at one another and disputing one another that the Romans intervene and, and Paul's rescued from the whole situation. So a uh, word of knowledge right there is, is very uh, helpful uh, in this case for Paul. I guess uh, we're going to have enough time. So we'll, well, briefly, I, I, we've been talking about wisdom. I keep saying knowledge, but this is the word of wisdom, uh, given words that, that result in an action uh, that, that is profitable for the situation. And it, it's wisdom that's divinely given by God. And you can say, well, maybe it's just circumstance. You know, Paul, Paul was just using his head there and got lucky. Eh, I think that when we're in, in certain circumstances, we're, we're given the words, and Scripture tells us that very thing. Um, you know, look at Peter and John in, in Acts chapter um, 4. You know, they said, hey, you know, we're, we're not going to quit preaching Jesus. And I believe it was uh, Gamaliel that stood up and said, hey, if what these men say is true, then it's from God. And if it's not, then they'll be like a, a, a fading fad. And so, again, Lyle's point is let's, let's not, you know, take issue with them because it's from 
God, then we're going to be opposed from God. So we get wisdom and, and we're, we're given certain words um, to initiate uh, certain responses or actions uh, that are profitable for building each other up or for building up the kingdom of God. Now, knowledge. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. I kept referring to that as a word of knowledge or as a word of wisdom. I, I, I've kind of got my hat on backwards this morning, I guess. So knowledge exists. Uh, the thought being about the word of knowledge um, is that it exists in two different camps. Uh, the first camp believes that uh, divine knowledge comes from study, that you study your scripture um, and, and you, you, you pray through scripture, you memorize scripture, you do, you do all these things, and this is the divine knowledge that you, that you get. Now, the other camp is knowledge that is given from the Spirit, where you come across some information that you wouldn't have known otherwise. Um, that what you weren't aware of, it, it's this, it's this knowledge, this information that comes to you that is given to you by the Spirit. Now, both of these gifts, uh, word of knowledge and word of wisdom, they're not necessarily perpetual. As a matter of fact, you may, you may never get this gift, or you may get it once for a very specific purpose. And so we just don't know. Um, but we have some great examples in Scripture of knowledge from the Spirit. Um, the first one, the first two actually, is from uh, the book of Second Kings. We're going to talk about the prophet Elisha. Uh, he is the protege of Elijah. So Second Kings, we're going to go to chapter 5. Second Kings chapter 5. And we're going to hear about a leper by the name of Haman, or Naaman. And Naaman just isn't any regular person. This is what we're told in verse 1 of chapter 5. Now, Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram, or Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because of him. The Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier but he had leprosy. So he's given instructions and encouragement to go to Elijah, prophet of God, to be healed of leprosy. So picking up in verse 9, So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to him to say, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, wave his hand over the spot and cure my leprosy. Are not Abna and Fafar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went off in rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of the boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. And Elisha's basically like, I don't want your money. Um, you know, this was God, not me. But Elisha has a servant named Gehazi. And Gehazi um, wants to take matters into his own hands. He thinks that uh, there's some money to be made here. So um, he goes out and meets Naaman. And uh, it says, so Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything else all right? Gehazi answered, my master sent me to say, 
Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Ephraim, please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothes. Now, Elisha clearly said, I don't want your money, but Gehazi has taken matters into his own hands. So Gehazi comes back, and Elisha says, where have you been, Gehazi? But Halazi said to him, uh, your servant didn't go anywhere. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes, olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, or manservants, or maidservants? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went to Elijah, from Elijah's presence, and he was leprous as white as snow. So Elisha is given this word from the Lord about what uh, Gehazi has done. And Elisha is able to directly confront Gehazi about it and tell him what he shouldn't have known otherwise. And uh, because of that, it's like justice was done because Gehazi had went behind uh, Elisha's back. So the second example that I have is still uh, Elisha in chapter 6. You go to verse 8. It says, Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. In verse 9. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel. This being Elijah, sent word to the king of Israel. Beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? He thinks he's got a rat. None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. How does Elisha know this? He gets a word of knowledge from God. So we have uh, Jesus with some words of knowledge, of course. Um, one of my favorites is in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. You're going to be very familiar with this scripture. Uh, starting in verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip... He said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. What's that tell you about the Jews, the Israelites? They were full of deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall say, see greater things than that. He add, then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. If you've watched any of the uh, series The Chosen, uh, there is a great episode uh, about this calling of Nathaniel, and it, it's quite awesome uh, the way they portray it, and it brought tears to my eyes. But Jesus has this knowledge of what Nathaniel was doing long before Nathaniel and Jesus ever meet face to face, uh, and it wasn't because uh, Jesus had somebody tell him. No, Jesus just knew these things. Uh, second example, 
Uh, turn back to Matthew 22, another good one. Pharisees are up to it again, along with the Herodians. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Matthew 22. Yeah, that's that's about Caesar paying taxes. We've already went over that one once, so we won't go over it again. But uh, basically, Jesus, you know, says, uh, "Give unto God what is God, and give unto Caesar what is Caesar's." But in doing that, um, he was able to use that knowledge and wisdom together in order to keep there to being a conflict between followers of his. So. He used that knowledge that he had and was given that word um, so that he could avoid that. Our last example in this is uh, Matthew 16. Matthew 16. And this is, I think, a word of knowledge that uh, comes to each one of us. And we might not get it from the Spirit. We might get it from Scripture. And we might get it right here from Matthew 16. But it is a realization that each one of us needs to come to, and it's a proclamation that each one of us must speak with our own mouths and demonstrate in our lives. Starting in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Why do people what who who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, some others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, and listen to what he says. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man but by my Father in heaven. Peter was the first one to come to this realization and make this declaration that this is who Jesus is. And come to faith, come to terms, uh, come to terms with his own position as a, as a follower, uh, knowing now exactly that he wasn't serving any ordinary rabbi that this was uh, Jesus, the Son of the living God. And so each one of us, like Peter, needs to come to that realization, uh, have that word of knowledge, and then demonstrate it. Um, and hopefully we do it in a wise manner. Now, again, I just want to reemphasize that you know there are people that are astute, um, shrewd even, um, Good businessmen, talented with decisions. Good businesswomen, talented with decisions. But but those are just God-given abilities. Um, they're not uh, divinely inspired episodes. Uh, there's a good word. Episodes of wisdom and spirit. Actually, Sp uh, Skip Heitzig uses that word. Um, an episode is a momentary thing with a very specific purpose of uh, providing uh, an answer or uh, providing knowledge that only God can give and that we can use um, to help make a decision or, or help a circumstance go in a certain direction. Now, pray for these gifts, um, and, but, but be careful. Um, people can... Tell you they've had a word of knowledge from the Lord, and it can be very vague. It can be very generic, and those are the ones you have to look out for. And you're going to have to use your own um, prayer life and discernment uh, to and scripture to try to wade through what is from God and what is not. Uh, we have to be careful. Um, I've had instances, I guess, uh, where people have told me as they left church that that was just exactly what they needed to hear, as if I were preaching directly to them. Now, I'm preaching God's Word, uh, and I don't necessarily know their circumstance, but 
for whatever reason, God has given me his word, uh, the knowledge of his word, maybe the wisdom of, of how to uh, ap- apply it to life, life then, and building a bridge to life now. And uh, no, that's what good analogies are for. Uh, that's what good um, stories of life circumstances are for, where we can actually um, see these things play out where the river meets the road. Uh, I pray you have a good week. Um, if you want to go ahead and, and be looking at verses 9 and 10, uh, we'll try to get to those next week and, and cover more of these spiritual gifts that are so important um, for our livelihood in the church and in the kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be together this morning to discuss these uh, important matters of gifts that the Holy Spirit gives, uh, powers that are from on high directed uh, to us through the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Father, help us to uh, pray for knowledge and wisdom every day, that we don't just rely on our own knowledge, our own discernment, um, our own intellect or abilities, that we seek out how you would have things done, uh, what you would have us know, uh, so that we can make good decisions. And, And Father, help us always realize that we shouldn't seek out your wisdom and knowledge uh, to puff ourselves up or build our own egos, but to to help someone else, to demonstrate love to someone else, to maybe provide a peaceful solution to a hard problem. Father, we're grateful for these promises. We thank you for all that you provide. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great Sunday, friends.